All right, hello everybody and welcome to Patriots First and Goal. I am Alex Shane here breaking down the Super Bowl, the NFL offseason, now it's officially here, and all things Patriots. A lot of new faces on the Patriots coaching staff coming in, and yep. there's a lot to talk about in that respect. Rich, it's been a while since you and I touched base. We kind of lamented the Patriots season, which, which ended technically back in like October, but uh, officially at the end of the season. We had a little recap there. Yeah, but it's good to get back on the airwaves with you to talk about Super Bowl, Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, and to new Patriots coaches. How you doing? I'm doing well. I mean, a lot has happened in the past few weeks. Like, I, I can't believe how uh, just in, like, what, four short weeks, uh, there's a new greatest quarterback of all time. Uh, <laughs> Alec, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you, man, but uh, narratives change a lot in a couple weeks. They most certainly do. And I'm excited to talk about that with you because I really don't want this to be any kind of a Mahomes bashing scenario because he doesn't deserve it. The guy's a beast. But um, in the words of, is it Randy Moss or Nate Burleson? Come on, man. Just insane <laughs> being there. But first, let's talk about the Super Bowl itself. How did you enjoy the game? Did you like it? Did it look with expectations to you? What would you think overall? I mean, okay. I felt like it was fine. And I know that the Patriots have been a part of multiple Super Bowls that played out this way. And I'm, you know, not to take anything away from Chiefs fans or anything like that. But like, you remember when the Patriots beat the Rams for the second time and it was just a snooze fest. <laughs> it was one where it's like, yeah, it's a defensive battle. Sure, that can be great and all. But yeah, you kind of just want to see someone make a play on offense. And like outside of Gronk making that big catch at the end of it, there wasn't a lot to really reflect on uh, on the offensive side. And like, sure, uh, Jason McCourty's pass breakup, that was fantastic. The first half of this game felt a lot like that Super Bowl when it was just like, oh, just a mistake after a mistake. Like the Chiefs had like five fumbles in the first half, including like a couple muffs. And then uh, McCaffrey had a fumble for the 49ers. And it just felt like drive after drive, it was becoming inevitable that the Chiefs were going to win. Even though the the 49ers had that lead, it felt inevitable because they were letting the Chiefs hang around. They were making mistakes. You saw the Chiefs make those kicks and those plays that you do to win it. Getting a 57-yard field goal, that happens when you win on the margins. When you uh, block an extra point, that's how you win on the margins. When you uh, recover a muffed punt and then score a touchdown on like the immediate next play, you're going to win. Th those are all the 50-50 uh, plays that determine the Super Bowl, similar to uh, you know Edelman's impossible catch. You only get so many of those whoa kind of plays in a given Super Bowl, and it felt like most of them went towards the Chiefs even though maybe they weren't necessarily a better team overall, they absolutely deserve to be Super Bowl champions, and they absolutely outclassed the, the 49ers throughout the whole game. Yeah, I mean, I, I was saying all week, the Niners have zero chance of winning this game. At no point, at any point during that Super Bowl, that I'm like, Niners are win this game. I never thought it, even when they were, they were winning and they had the lead late. Uh, and then when the overtime happened and they drove down and only scored a field goal, like, well, that's it. Chiefs are scoring yep. here. Um, and yep. that reminds me of the Patriots. You know, the dynasty is here. The Chiefs dynasty is alive and well. And like Mahomes, like Brady, he's going to score. He's inevitable. And there's nothing to do to stop it. And the Niners just let the Chiefs hang around for yep. a long time. They could have been up 15, 16, 17, 20, nothing. And just couldn't do it. And the Chiefs capitalized. And it's it's good to see. I think Mahomes is awesome. I really enjoy watching him play. Totally. Uh, I think he's going to have a massive, amazing career ahead of him. He's only 28 years old. I don't know if he'll play till he's 45, the way Tom Brady did. I don't know if his style of play is conducive to being an old, creaky quarterback. He's not really a pure pocket passer. He's got more versatility than that. But, you know, it's it's a good thing for the, the sport of football. I did hear an amazing stat today that the, page, uh, the Chiefs have not been called for holding once in a single Super Bowl they've played. They've been in what four with Patrick Mahomes? That's not a wild. single, not a single holding penalty. That's just insane to me. You can call holding on every play if you want to. I'm not saying the NFL's fixed. It's just a really weird stat that one of the most penalized offensive lines in the NFL got no holding calls and not one in 13 quarters of NFL Super Bowls. So it's kind of a, a interesting stat to me. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, uh credit to Joe Tooney. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is one where it feels like so many of those like 
close calls go in the favor of the the chiefs but it's also one where it's like we've also have seen those narratives over the year and it's like that's not to take anything away from the chiefs because uh what is it it's it's fortune favors the prepared and the Chiefs are always prepared. They uh, are the disciplined team that the Patriots used to have under Bill Belichick. They are the teams that are ready for any given scenario. They are the team that after the Super Bowl, they were like, this is exactly our plan for overtime. We know exactly what we're going to do. And then you had 49ers players being like, I didn't know the overtime rules. Like, what are we going with this on that? And so like, they deserve it. They, they absolutely okay. do. Um, and then just like from a what is Mahomes trajectory in my book, he's a top four quarterback of all time at this point, th- already at this stage of his career. Brady, a distance away at number one. I saw this stat that like from a postseason success perspective, he is Mahomes and Montana combined. Like it, it, it's a Gretzky level. You're not going to get here by the age of 28. Um, but if you were to say that, you know, he is going to surpass Montana, is he going to surpass Peyton Manning? I'm willing to put him in those conversations right now. Maybe he hasn't surpassed them yet, but at age 28 and knowing how much career he has in front of him, I have no problem putting him as top four. And if you were to rotate him with Montana and Peyton as that, that two to four spot, absolutely. And I, I think that he absolutely deserves that. I mean, Patrick Mahomes has had the best start to a career of any quarterback ever. And that beats Brady. He beats Brady through six years. Uh, where it gets absolutely absurd is there are people already saying he's the GOAT. And it just doesn't, I know it's like the narrative. You want to get the page views and the clicks and have all that, but it's just kind of silly and really detracts from what Mahomes has accomplished so far early on by already comparing him to the GOAT. And it's annoying from a Patriots fan perspective, not because I'm like defensive about Brady, but when Brady got his third Super Bowl, it was like, well, Montana's got four. So he's not even close to the GOAT. And then Brady got his fourth. I'm like, well, Montana was undefeated in his. Brady lost the last two. So he's not the GOAT. And then he got his fifth. I'm like, well, well, yeah, but but the, the, the Falcons choked that away. That Brady didn't deserve that one. And then he got his sixth. And it was always oh, all defense. That was Belichick, not Brady. Brady's washed. And then he got his seventh in Tampa Bay over Mahomes and they were like fine god damn it he's the goat okay enough and those same people they cannot wait to trip it away yep. from and give it to Mahomes it's like they keep shifting the goalpost if you're going to hold Brady to impossible standards hold Mahomes to the same one but maybe let the guy play for 10 more years then we'll have the conversation yeah totally and like what made Brady the goat is how many transformations they went through it I think that he wasn't like the unified without question until he threw the Lombardi trophy across the river uh, in Tampa (laughs) then everyone was like he's all right he's cool (laughs) by me Um, but I, I feel like what made him so impressive is that he went through four different iterations, five different iterations of teams to reach the Super Bowl. He had his early career one. You know, they didn't win in 2007, but that was a brand new team and they made it then. 2011, they made it again with Gronk and and Welker. That was a new team. 2014, that was a completely different team with LaFell and with Gronk and Vereen. 2016, you you put, you know, you have your Chris Hogan out there. You have your James White. It's a bunch of different folks. Uh, And then you have your 2018 team, which is just like, the scraps of what was left on that roster. And then you go to an entirely different roster in Tampa and you go And the fact that he was able to find success in all of those different iterations is what makes him the greatest of all time. And it's one that Mahomes hasn't fully had to face yet. He has gone through that shift where Tyreek Hill has left. That is one big thing that he answered resoundingly this year and uh, last year too. But like once Travis Kelsey retires, once you have a top three tight end of all time retire, what are the Chiefs going to do on offense? Can they reinvent themselves? And that's kind of sometimes unfair to Mahomes because so much of it comes to can your front office find the right player and surround him with the right talent? And that's what Belichick offered Brady is the right roster time and time again. And so for the Chiefs, for Mahomes to have any chance of actually legitimately being the same discussion as Brady, he's probably going to have to reinvent the offense two more times, three more times over the course of his career, because Kelsey is probably going to be on the way out in the next three years. I know that like the Gonzalez and Wittens of the world and even Gates can like play to their late thirties. So who knows? Maybe Kelsey has another four years in him, 
but there is going to be a cliff. There is going to be a time that they're going to have to find the next new way to compete on offense. And that's when we'll be able to really elevate Mahomes potentially above Montana and above Peyton is if he's able to produce in that environment. I think he could too. I think he's very capable of doing totally. it. You know, he's such a versatile player. But again, let's just it's not, I'm not even knocking Mahomes. Let's just let Mahomes and enjoy his career. Let him enjoy what he's doing and and and, and bask in it. And then we can revisit the conversation in a little bit. Uh, last thing I'll say, it's the Patriots podcast. I'm gonna run a rant about Mahomes and Brady too much. But do you think, Rich Hill, if that exact Super Bowl had played out uh on Sunday and it was Tom Brady is on the Chiefs or is the Patriots, is the Patriots versus the Niners and the Patriots won the exact way the Chiefs won. The narrative today would be, well, yeah, but there was that muff punt gave Brady a short field. It was his only touchdown pass of the entire half. They blocked a PAT. He drove down, had a chance to win it, only kicked a field goal. He had all these chances. The defense carried him. Brady's washed. Would that be the narrative right now? Yeah, and it'd all be true, right? Uh, obviously, <laughs> it would be true. No, I mean, I think a lot of things happen in the Super Bowl that go in their favor. And like it takes some Herculean plays uh, and those players will get their roses. I think for the Chiefs, they somehow won with it felt like, I don't know, was there any like jaw dropping like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they made that. Or did they kind of just outlast the 49ers with their mistakes? And it kind of felt a little bit on that latter piece. Um, and so, you know, if Brady was in that environment, I'm sure it'd be like, a, oh, he didn't look great. You know, like obviously Peyton was a different situation in his final season with the Broncos, which is like limping towards the finishing line um, because like, you know, Mahomes is actually good. But I think that there would definitely be a bunch of like, OK, like maybe they didn't win because of the offense. They they, they won uh, around the offense. Um, but I, I don't know. You, I think maybe with Mahomes when he was like doing that scrambling late. It was one where it's just like, mm, he's putting this team on his back, huh? Yeah. And they're gonna win because of him. That, I, that was like what he had like a 33 yard scramble or something like that at the end. It was like, he's MVP. He's absolutely the MVP right now. Yeah, and that's the Brady effect. Like there are a few quarterbacks when he's got the ball. It's like it's when the Patriots won the coin toss in overtime against the Falcons. That game was over, and everyone yep. knew it. Uh, Niners kicked that field goal. Mahomes got the ball back. They were gonna score a touchdown, and everyone knew it. And that's on Mahomes, and credit where credit is due. Congrats to the Chiefs. Enjoy the dynasty. We have to pass the torch now as Patriots fans for the most ins insufferable, obnoxious, smug, entitled fan base in the NFL. It now belongs <laughs> to Chiefs fans. Hope you all wear it well. If you need any pointers how to be a complete jerk of a fan, come see us, Pats fans. We've been doing it for 20 years. Um, but again, <laughs> get your buckets with your first bet at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers – $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams. Quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Let's, let's move on, Rich Hill. Second and goal, Patriots have a completely new coaching staff. I think the last time you and I actually got on the airways, Belichick was still the coach, and we haven't really talked about that yet. How'd you take the news? Yeah, I mean, it was one where I was a little sad to see it happen because I thought that if he had one more year, I could see them potentially change it around. Um, but it's another one where I'm like, okay, he had three chances to make this team compete. You know, like, obviously, we didn't expect a lot with Cam Newton in that year. But it was pretty blah. But we were like, all right, yeah, we, we believe the story that they went all in for Brady's final years. And so, like, we'll, we'll give that to him. They had a lot of money, brought in Mac Jones, put a lot of investments. They had, like, Judon and Henry and uh, Johnny Smith and all of these other players. And they looked pretty OK. They look they like, you know, they made the playoffs. They had some potential out there. And then you just remember he brought in Matt Patricia to run the offense with Joe Judge. <laughs> and that was a nightmare decision. That was so bad. He was actually trying to ruin this young quarterback. And then you remember that, oh, wait, from a pers like a personnel perspective, Parker and Juju 
And even Henry, who I think has been like a reliable mm -hmm. contributor, has been vastly overpaid. They traded away John Smith, what he did with Shaq Mason, what he did with having to overdraft Cole Strange and put him in a position that he never should have been in, uh, with mispositioning Michael and Wainu for you know multiple times to create a weakness that they didn't need in the first place. The, there are just so many personnel and recruitment and free agency and draft decisions, Taekwon Thornton, that he's made over and over and over again that for this past year, for them to bottom out at four and 13, mm -hmm. even with their really bad record and one score games that we're obviously going to see a regression next year. And they're probably just going to be a seven and, and 10 team on the foundation of they can't lose that many one score games again. <laughs> um, but he built this offense that embarrassed the team with multiple shutouts with an inability to win while holding opposing teams to like single digits. Like there, there, there was uh there was failure on special teams. There was failures on offense. There was failures through the draft. There were failures through free agency. There was failures in the coaching staff. There was failures in the scouting department. There were so many failures that have just stacked up in multiple iterations it wasn't just once it was over and over again that i don't blame the patriots for saying it's time it is time yeah i mean again i'm on record multiple times saying i wanted to see belichick get one more year i'd love to see what totally. he could have done with a top three draft pick and a ton of cap space that would have been nice uh but you know i i feel like the decision seemed to be pretty mutual Maybe it just made sense. I don't know what went on, obviously, inside that room with Kraft and Belichick, but uh, it just seemed like it was just it made sense to make the clean break right now. This is a total rebuild of this team, and if you're starting from scratch, which the Patriots more or less are, why not go with a new coach? And God bless you, Belichick. You brought me joys. I never thought I'd experience as a Patriots fan, so he'll always be awesome to me. Uh, but I'm psyched for Gerard Mayo. I think that's a good hire. Uh, I think he's a very smart player. I think he's been a very good coach. Kraft wasted no time in hiring him, which leads me to believe he's been thinking about this for a while. Uh, the last mm -hmm. head coach Bob Kraft hired sent team to work out pretty well for this team. So, you know, I'm, I'm riding or dying with Gerard Mayo and uh, I'm psyched to hear your thoughts on the people he's brought in. Uh, so maybe we should start with that. Gerard Mayo's offensive coaching staff. Uh, what are your thoughts on Mayo and who he's brought in to help coach the offense? Yeah, um, we'll see. We'll see. There's still like things being settled. Alex Van Pelt, offensive coordinator, TC McCartney coming over to be the quarterbacks coach. Uh, he was formerly the tight ends coach at the Browns with Van Pelt, who was the offensive coordinator there. They just brought in Taylor Embry to be the running backs coach. He was with the Jets for the past three seasons. Uh, I believe his brother, John Embry, is like the front office for the Chiefs or something like that, I want to say. Um, but, you know, they signed Taekwon Underwood as the assistant wide receiver coach. Scott Peters, the offensive line with Robert Cooper. Googler, and then Ben McAdoo as the offensive assistant. Um, I don't know, man. <laughs> it, it's one of those things where you can believe the narratives around some of these coaches in that Alex Van Pelt glue guy for the Browns really overachieved for them with all the injuries that they faced. Players were shocked that he was let go. They loved him. Ben McAdoo he wanted to take Patrick Mahomes banged his hands on the table for the giants to take him has had some success as the offensive coordinator, less so as the head coach for the giants, but has had success at offensive coordinator kind of, uh, but really like Josh Allen, and Lamar Jackson in that draft. So like, is he a quarterback scout fiend? Like maybe, maybe I just feel like there's enough things where I'm like, but the, the Browns offense wasn't good under Alex Van Pelt. And it's not like the Patriots are going to have all of a sudden better personnel than what the Browns did. They don't have mm -hmm. an Amari Cooper. They don't have a, like a Kareem Hunt or a Njoku. They don't have a lot of the players like a Chubb. I know he was dealing with injuries. They don't have a lot of the players. They certainly don't have the Browns offensive line. They don't have a lot of the players that led or like could have afforded success, albeit with a lot of injuries at that quarterback spot. But they ranked 23rd in points per drive, 28th in yards per drive. They ranked 10th in points scored overall. Sure. It's because they had the best defense in the league. We've seen this before with the Patriots last year as well for the Browns, 18th in points per drive, 18th in points overall. Uh, the year before that with Van Pelt as well, 20th in points per drive, 20th overall. 
this has not been a good offense under Van Pelt. He has the history, so I kind of understand that. You know, he he's coached uh, under <clears throat> McCarthy with uh, the Packers. He's coached uh, under uh, with the Bengals. Um, I believe he was the quarterbacks coach there under Zach Taylor. He was the offensive coordinator for the Browns. And so he played under Stefanski. So he's in theory, the perfect meld of what have been like the three most successful offenses in recent memory. A little bit of the McVay from his time with Zach Taylor, a little bit of the Shanahan McVay uh, with the Browns under Stefanski. Uh, in, you just had like a successful Packers offense overall. So, like, he's been around good offenses. I just feel like of all of the players or all of the coaching options, it was just a little blah. It just seems to me, like, following the news and whatnot, they'd be interviewing all these people and then, like, oh, that, that's a good pick. This guy could be good. Or I just like this interview. Um, you know, I know Wes Welker's out there. Maybe bring Wes Welker in. for, And then they just kind of hire somebody that – was like out of football last year or didn't get interviews anywhere else. Or and it makes me wonder if maybe it's a scenario where uh, a coaching staff position on the Patriots isn't really all that desirable right now. Yep. And um, you kind of have to prove yourself to be a, a decent coach and a good place to play before anyone's going to want to come in and play for you or coach for you, excuse me. And that puts Gerard Mayo up against it a little bit. I mean, I'm sure there, there's plenty of faith in him, but I get it. If you're looking to build a career and maybe become a head coach yourself one day, you want to go somewhere where you have some chance for upper mobility and to maybe f- ruffle your feathers a little bit. And uh, if you're an offensive-minded guy looking at the New England roster with no quarterback, a good running back, and that's kind of it, um, I don't blame people for not wanting to come here. So uh, I think it might be a little telling as to the overall temperature uh, around the league of the Patriots that so many guys interviewed New England yep. and none of them signed. Yep. No, I totally agree. And I, I think that you look up and down this roster, it's not good. It, it is a bleak offense. Uh, you know, their offensive line, their best players are both free agents with Onwenu and uh, Trent Brown. And obviously like, Brown doesn't want to come back. We'll see if the uh, like you know Belichick leaving changes it, but like he was not happy here this past year. Uh, and they're stuck with wide receivers that are definitely blah uh, outside of Pop Douglas. They have no tight ends on the roster. Uh, they have Ramondre Stevenson. That's good. Um, that's kind of it. They're building this offense from scratch, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe they'll be able to build it in some sort of successful image, but there's not a player on this Patriots offense. And I'm like, all of a sudden I feel like they're going to uncork now that they have uh, Alex Van Pelt at the helm here. And uh, I I think that really this offense is going to be pretty bad for another year. Maybe not as bad as it was this past year uh, because it's like pretty impossible to be that bad, but (laughs) I'm just, I, I just, don't know where the offense goes from here yeah i mean i you know for the longest time i think one of the reasons the patriots got so many cream free agencies were playing with tom brady new england was a sexy place to come you know you were almost guaranteed to at the very minimum get a first round playoff by and probably host the eighth championship game and go to the super bowl um and so guys would take less money or they'd want to come play here and if you're a coaching guy and you're looking at the roster like there's nothing sexy about new england having to build a roster from scratch in the Northeast in January. No, thanks, man. I, I get it. Um, but uh, on the plus side, Rich, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to withhold judgment on this until maybe these guys are kind of all come together and they'll, they'll work perfectly as a unit and they'll all understand each other really, really well. And uh, there are some young talented <laughs> players on the roster that maybe Gerard Mayo can get the best out of them. We will soon see. Um, the good news though, Rich Hill is that uh, defensively the Patriots should still be pretty damn good next year yep um so if the Patriots could just be a little bit just a little bit better on offense they might be able to hang so let's talk defense special teams in just a second after this right back all right rich hill third and goal Patriots defense most of the key players are coming back we're getting Gonzalez back off injury they're getting Matthew Judon back off injury Marcus Jones should be back off injury most of the core is in place for New England Patriots defensively so there's a lot of optimism there if the Patriots had just scored like a point a couple of times, they would have won. 
Uh, my personal <laughs> favorite hire of the offseason so far on the coaching standpoint is Dante Hightower. Really yep. psyched to have him back <clears throat> as a linebackers coach. Uh, but what are your overall thoughts on the defensive coaches so far Mayo's brought in? Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of makes sense. So Steve Belichick left to the University of Washington to be their defensive coordinator. Brian Belichick is staying to be the safeties coach. Uh, Pellegrino staying at cornerbacks. Uh, Patriots have brought in Jerry Montgomery uh, from uh, the Green Bay Packers to be the defensive line coach, backfilling to Marcus Covington, who was promoted to defensive coordinator. And then they just brought in Drew Wilkins, who had previously spent some time uh, with Matthew Jude on himself, actually, with the Ravens. Uh, and then they obviously brought in Hightower, as you said. This is great. Honestly, I'm pumped yeah. about this defense. I, I feel like there's going to be very little drop off. I know Belichick has a lot of magic and mystique around him. And I think Steve Belichick was a very crucial and important part for the team's success on defense. I think uh, there's been some reports out there. Who knows if it's verified or anything like that, just based off of uh, like, you know, repeated reporting on it. But Mayo and Belichick, it sounds like split the role of the defensive leaders a lot where Belichick might have been the one drawing up the X's and O's. Mayo was dealing with the people. He was the one that was connecting with the players, making sure that they were all on the same page. And so it sounds like the Patriots have a little bit of a strategic side to backfill, but they also have Mayo and Hightower who have been some of the smartest coaches or players that the Patriots have ever had. And then you have a lot of continuity with Covington who's made this defense really good up front. You know, remember that stretch of time where the defensive line was like pretty mediocre They've been good as of late. You know, they were the best run defense in the league. You have coming to uh, you have Pellegrino and Belichick like they're good. They, they have consistency. They have, as you said, not a lot of free agents. Uh, you know, they have Jalen Mills, Miles Bryant uh, outside of like Duggar. And then, you know, if you want to consider Uche and Jennings in that category as well, um, a lot of the players that are up for free agency outside of Duggar are pretty rotational, you know, in an ideal state. I think Bryant has a bright future. I think we'll come back. But at its core, this defense is going to be able to continue what they did last year. I'm not anticipating a big drop off. And honestly, I, I'm pretty excited to see what Covington is going to be able to do with this defense. And, I, you know, it'll be just a season of reloading uh, as opposed to rebuilding. Let me ask you this, Rich Hill. As the defense was pretty much the sole strength for the yep. Patriots in 2023, do you think those kind of run it back? You know, obviously it's early. There's still a lot of free agents and trades and draft picks and all that stuff. So we don't know a full picture of the defense. But would you expect the defense we saw in 2023 to be more of more or less the exact same unit in terms of packages, personnel, how they apply pressure, et cetera? In general. I mean, I think what we'll see uh, is that Anthony Jennings, I think his future is his, – he's just getting started. He, he really came into his own this past year. He's a free agent. I think the Patriots will sign him. He reminds me a lot of Rob Ninkovich in the sense that he is just so reliable out there. He is on the edge. He is stopping the run. He's generating pressure, maybe not getting the sacks, but he is reliable as all else, and that matters a lot. And so I, I think that they'll try to retain Jennings out there. We'll see if Uche gets a lot of more money on the free agent market. But if they keep Duggar, if they get Jennings – I think that this defense is going to be able to do the exact same thing as they've always done. They have all of the flexibility with, you know, the safety linebacker hybrids. Maybe Mapu can take a jump next year. Um, as you said, Gonzalez is back. They're going to have depth at every single position. Obviously, their defensive interior is getting a little bit older with Lawrence Guy, but, you know, Barmore, breakout player. Uh, so I, I can see them like wanting to retain, uh, you know, him for the, the long term. I just think that the pieces are here for them to just continue what they're doing. And if it isn't broke, there's nothing to really fix. For sure. As long as they bring Duggar back, <clears throat> break free agency to acquire. But again, that's a free agency podcast. Getting ahead of myself. That leaves one squad, Rich Hill, the one that Belichick always prided himself on. Yep. The special teams. Fourth and goal. Yep. Special teams unit. The Patriots Wolf. have been so bad on special teams for so long. <laughs> I don't know why they brought in Jeremy Springer, not Jerry Springer. I know we all heard so Jerry confusing. Springer. So confusing. Jerry Springer has passed away, unfortunately. Although Jerry Springer, as special teams coordinator, would be awesome. He fights every single punt. <laughs> um, but Jerry <laughs> Springer's brought in. Um, I think he was a Rams assistant, I believe, before before yep. he came to Patriots. Um, he spent the first two seasons in the NFL coaching in LA. And now he's here, a college team special coach for a uh, college special teams course for a while. I don't really know Jeremy Springer that well. Or any intel on him that I might not know about? Yeah, I mean, there, there's two paths that you can take on this: is that you look at his 
interviews over the years and he says all the right things you know he's like we, we have a team here on the special teams unit we don't want to be the cause for losses we want to be disciplined we want to be the reason that we get the hidden yards we want to be able to win the game because games are won on the margins and we're the margins and he says all the right things for what you want there and focuses a lot on the attention to detail from a proof in the pudding perspective the only special teams unit worse than the Patriots in 2023 was that of the Rams. And so <laughs> I have no idea what connected Jeremy Springer to Gerard Mayo. There is no shared experience. There is no like overlap in any capacity. Uh, he was the special teams coordinator of the university of Arizona from 2018 to 2020, the from Marshall in 2021. And then the Rams assistant special teams coach for 2022 and 2023, I have no idea. <laughs> and the question for the Patriots, you know, obviously, like if they get a kicker, if Chad Ryland fixes it, I don't know, like what to expect on that front. But like if he can fix it, then like that gets a big chunk of the, the problems resolved. But you look at all the advanced stats metrics and the Patriots were one of the worst return teams in the entire league. They have no spark on special teams they they have uh you know they maybe not like don't give up a lot of big chunk plays but they don't do anything on their own they're not winning anything on the margin they're losing on the margin Beringer is like the only plus player that we saw on special teams uh on a reliable basis you know obviously cody davis was coming back from injury and they have some other like quality players on special teams sure but as a whole the unit was very very bad and so can the patriots turn it around under jeremy springer Maybe, but this is one where there's just like no history to really go off of. No, there's not. <clears throat> and although I don't think he's officially retired yet, Matthew Slater, I don't think he's officially gone yet, but I, I can't imagine him coming back in any capacity. So not a lot to go off of there, and they're losing their special teams captain as well. Maybe Schooler's the guy to step up, but that's some pretty massive shoes to fill. So I'm really interested and curious to see what takes place because there's a couple of games where the special teams more or less cost the Patriots. I mean, there was the Ryland shank against the giants comes to mind uh, because there were some, some deep kick returns that cost the Patriots points. And when the offense just could not score in any yep. capacity, the field position game became so important and yep. special teams were consistently letting this unit down. So, all right. So basically it's a, if you were to grade the special team tire so far, it'd be an incomplete is what you'd basically say beyond incomplete erring on the side of potentially bad in the sense that like <laughs> i mean maybe he'll surprise everyone and be just a fantastic special teams coach overall but there's accomplished special teams coaches out there that have a track record of being average that's all you need you don't need to have an elite special teams unit especially at this stage maybe at some point like yeah you try and upgrade but you're just trying to get back to the ground on this one for special teams and taking a big swing with someone who was on the worst special teams unit in the league feels like a pretty big stretch. And so uh, obviously happy to be proven wrong on this one, but I'm just scratching my head at it. All right. So if you can take this podcast away, Rich Hill is obviously brimming with confidence with, with his Patriots coaching staff. He has no <laughs> doubts where anybody's going to end up. Uh, look, Not I mean, I, what, I, what, I, what, what I like about this whole thing is – it's such a complete unknown, right? There's, you know, this is the first head coach the Patriots have had, first new head coach in the 21st century. I mean, that's literally the first one they've had. They have no real track record to speak of. I think this this represents a fresh start for everybody, and maybe this is one of those scenarios where Gerard Mayo, if this was a movie, Gerard Mayo would be that, like, upstart company with a bunch of ragtag employees taking on big tech or big pharma <laughs> or Google or whatever the bad guy is you want to name when you're ag tag upstart company. And, and maybe they'll turn some heads. Again, I do have faith in Gerard Mayo. I think he's a smart coach. Yeah. The, co the, the players seem to love playing for him. Uh, he's going to have a couple of years to, to prove his worth. Uh, and it all starts coming up pretty soon, Rich Hill. That's kind of our podcast. I know we're not really talking about free agency just yet, but I think how Gerard Mayo approaches free agency and the draft is going to go a long way to how well he ingratiates himself to the Patriots fans who are maybe a little more on the fence about him coming off the Bill Belichick era. You know, if he takes that third overall pick and trades down and trades down again, then drafts a DB in the second round and drafts a third round D D three safety. And then doesn't really make any moves in for agency beyond like the day two wide receiver that nobody wanted. And it's kind of more of the same. Uh, I can see some feathers <laughs> being ruffled 
around New England. But I have a feeling Gerard Mayo is going to take free agency for his own sake, if nobody else is in the draft, a very different approach than how Bill Belichick has to kind of put his own stamp on his off seasons. Yeah, totally. Well, and I mean, like we can't go through this podcast without mentioning how very clearly influential Elliot Wolf has been on this Patriots entire off season director of player personnel for the Patriots. Patriots don't have a GM with a vacancy of, of Bill Belichick, but the number of folks with either Browns or Packers connections that he's brought in uh, pretty astounding. So like Van Pelt, came over from the Packers uh, Montgomery on the defensive line. He knew him from his time with the Packers. Uh, and it's just you bring in the overall Browns because Wolf was there of 2018, 2019, obviously not overlapping uh, with a lot of these coaches there, but like he knows the Browns infrastructure. He knows what he's trying to bring in. There's just a continued line of what is going to happen. And for me, the biggest question in the draft that I'm wondering is, uh, how much influence did Belichick have on those draft picks that I am scratching my head at? And, you know, the best pick that the Patriots have had in recent years is Barmore. And it was just because he was so, uh, he was rated so much higher than that. And so if the Patriots finally take the strategy of just like taking literally the best player on the board, I'll have a lot of faith in them, but I'm curious to know if uh, we're going to see more of the same in the draft as we've seen in recent years. Well, Rich, we will soon find out, or I guess not that soon. We still have the combine, <laughs> and then we have free agency to officially start, and the draft's like two months away. So lots to cover between now and then. Again, I don't even know. I've not done any research in terms of the who. I know who like the big free agents are, but it's always a pretty deep class. We'll do our deep dive there. We'll do our draft deep dive. Uh, I've moved on to the NBA and March Madness and pitchers and catchers, so I should get back into the swing of things. Uh, it's always <laughs> nice. I think this time of year is really enjoyable because for those of us who – quote unquote, cover the Patriots for a living um, or a, a very meager living, we should call it. Uh, it's good to have some time away from the game to kind of reappreciate uh, how much fun football is because every April or so I start to really miss it. And then the draft comes and you're all excited. Then it's mini camp. And before you know it, it'll be preseason again, Rich. We'll be, we'll be running it back. Totally. And my favorite time of the football season anyways is the play game that's played on paper. I love the free agency and I love the the draft part of it. And like, you know, Injuries happen. Seasons can go sideways a little bit, but you know, I enjoy watching the process go well. <laughs> so if it's going to be a good uh, next couple of months for me, uh, I'm very excited to see what the Patriots do with all the cap space that they have in free agency. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to break that down with you. Sounds good, man. We'll talk soon. Cool. All right. Well, until next time, Alec, you have a good one. You too, buddy. See you. Later. Later.